Good evening and welcome to our service of worship as we remember the last night that Jesus spent with his disciples. Our opening hymn is found printed in your bulletin. It is What Feast of Love. I invite you to stand as we sing it together. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it, and gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I 
I tell you, I shall not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom.
was now the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land. Then Jesus, crying in a loud voice, said, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? And again, crying in a loud voice, Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Good evening. I'm Pastor David Haley, your associate minister for visitation. It's my joy to bring the scripture reading this evening and also the message. Our scripture comes from the 13th chapter of John's Gospel, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 10 and verses 33 through 35. Now hear the word of the Lord. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. 
And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, Well, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. And then skipping down to verses 33 through 35. Jesus says, Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, Where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our midst that our hearts might be prepared to hear your word. May your anointing be upon the one who preaches, that his sins, though they be many, might not hinder your word. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. So we're thinking tonight about humility. Humility. A little humility never hurt anyone. Even pastors have humbling experiences. Uh, You may have heard the old story about the pastor who announced to his congregation that he was being moved in just a couple of months and would be going to a different church. And Afterwards, people were expressing their sorrow at his departure, and one lady seemed particularly upset. And the pastor said, now don't worry, I'm sure that the bishop will appoint someone far better than me to come and be pastor of this church. And the lady said, that's what they said last time and it didn't happen. (laughs) Even pastors have humbling experiences sometimes. Or how about this one, a pastor was asked to speak for a community group, and after his speech, the program chair handed the pastor a check. And the pastor said, you know, I I appreciate the honor of being asked to speak. Why don't you take this money and use it for one of your projects? And the program chair said, well, I, I think I'll put it in a special fund. And the pastor said, well, what's the special fund for? The program chair said, it's the special fund to get a better speaker next year. Mm. Yes, we can all use a little humility. And if you think you don't need it, don't worry, it's coming your way anyway. Well, on this Holy Thursday, when we remember the Last Supper, many churches will have a humbling experience, the experience of having a foot washing service. Um, I know that such a service has been held in this church before, and in many churches perhaps you have attended one, perhaps you've had your feet washed. Um, And the reason that churches do this is because this is the night when Jesus humbled himself 
and washed the feet of the disciples. And then he shared the Last Supper with them. And it was necessary because back in that day, people wore sandals or went barefooted, and they did most of their travel on foot. They walked along trails that were not only dusty, but also cluttered with camel and donkey dung. And I'm sure that guests arrived with more than dust on their feet. It was a common courtesy for the host to have his slave or servant to wash the guest's feet as they entered the house. Now, that was a very humbling duty, to wash the dust and grime and whatever else of the road off of the guest's feet. But on the night of the Last Supper, Jesus humbled himself, and he washed the feet of the disciples. And I think that we ought to do likewise. We ought to humble ourselves and to wash one another's feet. But not quite like they did. I'm already hearing sighs of relief. It's just not the same in our day. I, I read on the internet on a, a church webpage instructions for a foot washing service. And the instructions included, tell everyone to come to the service with clean feet, wearing clean socks. Now, that's just not the same as washing donkey dung off of someone's feet. It's just not. It's just not. Jesus got down to wash the disciples' feet because they wouldn't do it for each other. And Jesus is telling us that our importance is not in some position that we hold or in wealth or in some title or in some degree. It's in service. Our importance is in service. And Jesus is telling us that we should perform some equivalent humble service to one another. Okay, what might that humble service be in our culture? What's the hardest thing for 21st century Americans to do, particularly in political season? Well, I'd like to suggest tonight that it would be to apologize. To apologize. Most people would rather wash dirt and dung off someone else's feet than to admit that they're wrong, apologize, and ask forgiveness from someone else. So let's think about replacing foot washing, which actually is pretty easy, with apologizing, which is difficult and humbling. Think about who you might owe an apology to. Who have you wronged? Who have you gossiped about? Who have you failed to love? Who have you resented or been mean to? I encourage you to think about that. Identify that person and find a way and apologize to them. After all, Jesus said in Matthew 4, 23 and 24, he said, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Apologizing is a humbling experience, but it opens the door in your life and in the lives of others. And of course, the ultimate uh, door that it opens is the door for God's grace in your life and another person's life, in your relationship. And the ultimate apology that we need to offer, all of us, is to God. Now in the church, we call that repentance. We apologize to God for our sins. And we ask God's forgiveness, and we receive God's grace. That's what Holy Communion represents 
on this Maundy Thursday. Jesus went to the cross in order that we might be able to receive God's grace and be forgiven and have eternal life. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, we read, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. In the kingdom of God, a little humility goes a long way. It can begin with an apology. Apologize to God. Apologize to others whom you have offended or wronged. And it has to be a sincere apology, not like the little boy who was angry with his sister and called her stupid. And his mother said, you tell your sister you're sorry. And the little boy looked at his sister and he said, okay, I'm sorry you're stupid. Let's let our apologies be sincere and from the heart. On the night of the Last Supper, Jesus humbled himself. Tonight, may we humble ourselves before God and others and receive God's grace. Let us pray. Lord God, help us to humble ourselves, to pray, to seek your face, and turn from our wicked ways that we might receive your grace and that we might be instruments through which your grace is extended to others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue now in our service with Holy Communion. We have a special communion liturgy for our service tonight that you can follow along with in your bulletin. Jesus spent his life teaching us the meaning of love. Through word and deed, Jesus showed us how to love God and to love one another. He fed the hungry. He healed the sick. He invited the women and the children and the tax collectors and the sinners to come to his table. He broke bread with all the least and the lost and shared a cup of redemption with them all. He crossed boundaries of race, nationality, ethnicity, gender, and class. He challenged religious authority, and he scoffed at pomposity and self-absorbed grandeur. He called out the hypocrites. He admonished the scribes and the Pharisees for their hardened hearts. He brought a simple message. Love God, love yourself, and love one another. We gather in the name of Jesus and remember the way that he showed us. We remember not just his death, but his life. The way of Jesus goes through the cross, but we are not there yet. It is close. We can see its shadow. We can feel the cold, dark night. We know that the enemies of God are conspiring. They have had enough of him. He threatens their comfort. He threatens their way of life. He threatens their power. They will come for him. First, though, we will gather. We gather with Jesus and his closest friends. We gather with those who, that called him teacher, rabbi, friend. We gather for the Passover meal to remember that God saved the people from slavery. God saved once. God saves forevermore. God saved the Israelites at Passover and revealed that it is God who reigns not the Pharaoh. Our God saved once. God saves forevermore. 
even as they were sharing this sacred meal together, the disciples were not of one heart. Jesus knew that he was asking much from these men, and he knew that they would fail him. Judas had already agreed to betray Jesus to the religious authority. Was he angry, angry at some slight? Was he disappointed that Jesus would not raise an army against the Romans? Was he upset with the value of the oil that the woman wasted when she anointed Jesus? We will never know Judas's heart, but Jesus knew that he would be betrayed. And what Jesus did, and what did Jesus do with the man that would betray him? He broke bread with him. All of the disciples were deeply saddened, and they asked, I would never betray you, Lord. It's not me, is it? On the white night in which Jesus was betrayed by his friend, he took the bread, gave thanks to God, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until he comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory Amen. I'm going to ask those who are going to assist if they'll come forward now. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup of salvation for which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, I invite you all to participate in this holy meal. As Pastor David has already invited us with the sermon, I invite you now to come forward with sincere and humble hearts in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord.
Okay.